Hello everyone, welcome to Computer Science E7. Uh, this is lecture two when we talk about software and in the latter half we start talking about some light. So um, I just want to quickly mention some things that we discussed last time uh, just to make sure that everybody understands uh, a camera is not required for this course. Uh, you might find it easier to have one but you don't have to rush out and buy one especially since they, are, they cost some money. We do have some cameras available, these Panasonic Lumix digital cameras available for rent uh, from the Church Street Lab. You can get these at 53 Church Street. Just go in and you might have to show your ID and, or give them your ID while you rent it. But uh, these have the capabilities uh, for you to be able to perform all of the assignments throughout the semester. So you can't unfortunately rent it for the duration of the semester. I believe the limit is for 24 hours. But you can, uh, you'll be able to very easily uh, complete the assignments or relatively easily complete the assignments if you don't have a camera by going to rent one of these. And uh, we actually are starting sections this week and so we've released not only a schedule of sections here on the slide but also on the website so that you can go and, and verify what time these are. These start today uh, and the first one is after class in 53 Church Street, number 104. That's, that'll be led by John Selig, who stepped out for just a moment. Um, but uh, these are meant to be uh, more informal than lectures are, and they'll be a little bit smaller, and so you will, it'll be much more uh, discussion-based, much more question and answer sort of thing. So, and they'll be used to go over material that uh, needs to go over again. So maybe if, if there's something that you didn't quite understand from lecture, because I do talk very fast, especially when I start getting really excited about this stuff, um, and we'll slow it down a little bit. And uh, they may not last the whole two hours, so you don't have to plan for it lasting two hours, but uh, that's, that's up to John, and he'll have more details about that um, during sections. So uh, when uh, we're talking about digital cameras. Last week, we were talking a lot about the cameras themselves. So we, we talked a little bit about the history, and uh, we broke down an SLR and showed you some of the internals of it, the, uh, the mirror, the, the shutter, a variety of things that make it, makes it physically work, and so how, how it physically directs the light into the camera uh, and captures the light onto the sensor. But being digital, we can't worry just about the hardware. We're probably going to need to do something with the photos once we have taken them. We can't just, uh, uh, and, and though I think um, my mom might be guilty of this, we can't just leave them on the camera uh, for infinity and, and expect it to do something automatically. We usually have to have some additional software uh, to do something with the photos. And so uh, whether it's complex software like uh, some of the previews up here on, on screen or some simpler software that comes with your computer, iPhoto on Macs, for example, or whatever Windows uses these days, I don't even, I'm not even sure. You have to be able to download the photos onto your computer, and you usually want to be able to manipulate them in some way, whether that is a lot of manipulation using, for example, the, the, the archetypal Photoshop that everybody seems to use these days, uh, or whether you want to do some more advanced work with, uh, with RAW files, which you might use one of the, uh, the, the two pieces of software up top, so Phase One, Capture One, for example, or Apple's Aperture, or even Adobe's Lightroom, really depends on what you're trying to get out of these uh, pieces of software and also um, what you want to do with the photos. And uh, all of these software, all of this software ranges in price from free that comes with your computer all the way up to ludicrous amounts of money. And uh, so you don't have to jump out and, and spend any money to purchase this software uh, right away uh, until you realize what it can do for you and, and until you figure out which one might actually do what you want it to. And in fact, even the, these uh, applications that are listed up here each serve a relatively different purpose. So Photoshop, everybody knows as being the uh, application that you will want to use to modify images in some significant way. And in fact, uh, uh, we are going to be spending a lot of time focusing on Photoshop throughout this course when we're talking about software tools. Not uh, Today is, is more of an intro to that, but in, in later software tools lectures, we really dive into Photoshop and we see how we can do some very specific tasks with digital photographs in Photoshop. But once you start uh, taking a lot of photos, and maybe you're taking them not only in JPEG format, but also in, the, in your camera's RAW format, you realize that you're going to have to do some additional processing on them. So you might have to purchase some software like 
uh, Adobe's Lightroom or Apple's Aperture in order to organize and process your photos. Uh, there are other pieces of software available as well. For a long time, iView Media Pro was, was uh, a popular choice among professionals. Now, I don't, it's, it seems to have fallen by the wayside a little bit, but it was very good at the time, very good organizational tool to help, um, help you categorize and tag your photos and find them later, especially if you're taking lots and lots and lots of photos. Phase one, capture one, that's, um, this software, they have various versions of it, but it is also raw processing software. And so when we're talking about raw photos, uh, we'll talk more about them in detail at a later time, but basically they're just sort of the raw data that's coming out of your camera rather than being processed into a JPEG file, into that JPEG format that's lossy as we described before. Raw is not a lossy format, so you preserve a lot of the original quality and a lot of the original data that JPEG just simply cannot store. And so this usually means that you have to work a little bit more after the fact to be able to get all of the quality out of that raw file that you possibly can. And so that's what uh, some of this other software like Phase One, Capture One will actually do for you. And so organizing your photos um, uh, is, is really a question of, of personal preference. Now, some of you may prefer just using folders and files to do this. Um, and this is perfectly fine, but there's a problem with this, and that is that uh, it becomes, um, well, well, I should talk about the pros first. The, the pro is that it's free, it's easy to use, you, you can set up your organization however you like, um, but the problem is that you are then bound by that specific organizational tool. There's n really no other way to search for your files. You can't tag them with specific keywords, for example, and, and be able to search for them later on. And so this is what uh, a couple of software tools try to remedy. Uh, so this is a, a screen capture of, of iView Media Pro back when I used to use it. And uh, as you can see, it shows you a lot more information about the photos than you would get in just having them be on your, on your folder structure on your computer. Um, and in this case, it not only tells you the name of the file, but it also shows you a preview of it, which in most modern operating systems you could actually show as well. But what you wouldn't normally see is uh, a lot of the information that is provided by uh, the photo as well, such as some of the exposure details, the ISO speed, how it was metered, what, whether flash was used or not, so on and so forth. And uh, this, using this software, you could tag the photos with keywords, which you could go back and search for later and, and find them in, uh, in a variety of ways. You can see there's a search bar in the upper right-hand corner so that you could type in keywords, look for it, and search. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a variety of, of very useful features within the software, but there was a problem with this as well, and that was that it put all of your photos in one long list. If you see, uh, you can see that on the right here, there's six photos that are visible, but there's also a scroll bar, and you can see that the, uh, it actually will scroll for quite a long distance, and, that, and this is just to show that once you start adding more and more photos, it's hard to just sort of visually scan and find specific images within it. So um, modern uh, organizational tools and raw tools uh, such as Aperture or Lightroom, if you, if you take a lot of photos, you will probably end up using one of these two pieces of software, if not a, a competitor uh, that exists today. And uh, using one of these, you can actually get a lot more organizational help out of it. So you can arrange it not only by, uh, by tagging and by providing keywords to it, but you can also give them a folder structure, a file hierarchy that exists within it. So if you can see in this, in this left side over here, uh, there is, there's some small folders and, and, uh, and projects, as they call them, that you can use to organize your photos. And so this isn't meant to be uh, an advertisement for software, but just to show you what I think after working with this stuff for so long works and what doesn't work. And so um, it's taken me a long time to come to a photo organization that's like this or, or something that's relatively simple, but I've broken it down into relatively few categories. So you could break some of these up into further categories or even combine some of them depending on what you are working on in your particular photos. Um, but I found that this seems to work out pretty well for me. So I have, for example, a folder for jobs. So uh, something where I was hired to take some photos for something. All those photos go into jobs. So personal, that's stuff that's more fun. That's, those are photos that I take for myself, probably in my home or, or uh, what have you. And so places, that's 
it's, it's usually meant to be a little bit more local, so something like the Boston area or any of the, uh, the smaller cities surrounding Cambridge or what have you, any of these places, Burlington, Arlington, and so on and so forth. Uh, something that isn't really a devoted uh, trip or a vacation necessarily, but just something that I might visit on a quasi-regular basis. Then, of course, things and projects. These are not jobs in the sense that I wasn't paid for them, but these are things that I've been working on. So maybe I have uh, a set of photos that I want to manipulate in Photoshop, and I, will, and I want to have one place to work on them there. That might be the, the place for that. Then trips is pretty self-explanatory, I think, and work uh, deals with photos that I might take for my day jobs or for E7, for example. So I have a whole bunch of E7 photos in here related mostly to pinhole cameras. So if I were to expand this, you would see a whole bunch of pinhole photos from, uh, from a variety of semesters. Now, another thing that's useful when you're organizing your photos is to use ratings. Uh, so um, you can usually, in, in software, rate photos but with a given number of stars. And so sometimes it, rate, it ranges from zero to five stars, for example. Maybe you're given more or less. And uh, it took me also a long time to figure out how to use this effectively as well, because I realized that I was spending a lot of time just sitting there thinking, well, is this a four or a three? And I would think, you know, I really wish I had 3.5, but then I said, okay, no, this is getting to be a little bit too much. And so my workflow now involves using ratings to try to help me narrow down the photos that I want. So let's say I import hundreds of photos and I need to be able to process them. I need to go through them and select a subset of them that I want to display on Flickr or on my website, so on and so forth, or send to my family, for example. Then what I might do is go through each of them one by one and just rate it individually as three stars or fewer. If it's three stars, that means I think it's a worthwhile photo. Uh, it doesn't have any major technical flaws that detracts from the photo. It's a photo that I think could be interesting. Maybe it needs some work, something like that. Something that I think is interesting in a worthwhile photo, I'll give a rating of three and move on. Then from there, I will rate other photos a one or a two just based on how crappy I think it is, frankly. And by the end, so I've gone through a whole bunch of photos, maybe hundreds of photos, but doing this makes me go through them quickly. And that way, I can just move on and start processing them. So then I only view the photos that are three stars, and then I go through them a second time. And so by now, you will hopefully have decreased the number of photos at least in half, probably, hopefully, a lot less. Then you, when you go through it, it's a lot less painful, and you can spend more time looking at each photo individually and saying, OK, this photo, you know, it's, it's a great photo, but it has, it's slightly out of focus, or it's slightly blurry. And while I could spend some time working on this, it's not definitely not five star worthy. So maybe I'll decide to keep it a three star. If it has significant, uh, or if, it's, if it has some promise, maybe a four star. And just narrow it down and keep narrowing it down until eventually you get to a collection of four star photos. And those are the ones that you should spend time with and work on them and correct them. So while you can begin correcting some of these photos, and, and uh, in, in correcting, I mean doing a variety of software tasks, such as enhancing the contrast, fixing the color, really anything that you would do in software, I don't recommend that you start touching that stuff until you've narrowed it down a little bit, because then you're going to have a huge task ahead of you if you're taking a lot of photos to try to manipulate a sub, or if you're, if you're trying to manipulate all of them, it's just going to become overwhelming, and you will quickly find that it is not something that you want to spend a lot of time on. And frankly, even with myself, um, if, for those of you that have uh, already joined the Flickr group, if you uh, were, were stalking some of my, my Flickr photos, you may have noticed that I added a whole bunch of them recently, and that's because I had a backlog. I hate processing photos, but I love taking them. So I, will, I end up with thousands of photos that I have to go through, and then it's just such a pain to be able to go through it. And so anything that can be used, even to just help me just the tiniest bit to become faster processing these photos, helps significantly. And one of these ways is using uh, a workflow like that, where you just narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down continuously until you get to a small subset of photos that you want to work with. So this leads us to keywords. I used to be um, really gung-ho about keywords and tagging them, providing uh, specific words to photos that perhaps describe it in some way. And so this got, this got to such a ridiculous point when I was using Ivy Media Pro that if a, if a photo had a tree in it, I would put a keyword of tree. If it had a shadow that was potentially interesting, I would, and I would put, label it a shadow. And so 
now when, I, when I've, I've moved to Aperture and it's imported all of those keywords, and the first few versions of Aperture, just as a small anecdote, were really kind of slow. And importing all of those keywords just made it absolutely unbearable because there's thousands of keywords, and I've collapsed them all here. Uh, you can see there's an iView Media Pro keyword that has a bunch. If I clicked on that arrow and expanded it, we would be waiting several minutes for it to just keep working and show us all of the keywords. And it gets really ridiculous. Now, where I think keywords are useful is if you sell your photos, for example, in stock photography. So in stock photography, what you have to do is try to market your photos based on its content. So if you are taking a photo of, um, oh, I don't know, somebody that's doing accounting work, for example. You might have somebody in, in glasses, you know, you can do the stereotype, uh, with have somebody in glasses with a, a pen protector working on a calculator, for example, and you might then want to keyword each of these specific things because that will help expand your marketing for that particular photo. But if it's just for yourself, I've noticed that you really don't have to tag photos quite so much. You don't have to worry about it so much, and in fact, the, really the only keywords that I use are involved in this hierarchy, in this organization here. So I know that uh, if I want a lot of trees, for example, that maybe I want to go to some main trips where there's, I know that there's probably, I took, probably took photos of a lot of trees. So I'd go into trips and then look through some of the trips there, see if I could find one that was related to that. So I could use context of the photo to try to find some of these keywords. However, it really depends, of course, on what you want to do with this. So maybe you take a lot of uh, pictures of people, of your friends and of your family. You might want to have some keywords just of your friends and family so that you can tag your photos with, um, with those names so that you can easily find them later. There is actually some software, though. Um, I don't think uh, Aperture or Lightroom will do it. I think iPhoto, for example, will do this, where it'll try to automatically process each of your photos and find faces within them and then try to figure out whose face it is. So if you label a couple of photos with, um, with a name, uh, then it will associate all future photos with uh, that name and, and it'll actually show you that person's face. And so I tried it because it sounded kind of cool, but it, I don't think it works that well yet. I think they have to work on it a little bit. But it definitely is um, some, some neat technology. And if that's something that, that you want versus having a lot of uh, keyword specificity, then you might want to consider using some simpler software. Now, when we're talking about um, organization and keywords, you have to realize that the photos that you take in your camera actually have a lot of data embedded within it, something that you don't actually see when you're just viewing the picture on your screen or maybe even on your camera. There's a lot of detail about that photo that is recorded within the file and it's transferred Onto, onto your computer with the file. It's actually a part of the file that is not visible. And uh, any good photo organization program will show this data to you. And it can be very useful to you to try to figure out some of, to, uh, to try to figure out how, these, how this photo was taken or what settings you used and how you want to be able to change it in the future. So we can see that for this particular photo, it was taken on a specific date with a specific camera using specific settings. And we can use that to our advantage. And in fact, um, using this data, this is called EXIF metadata. And this is data that Flickr uses as well. Whenever you look at a Flickr photo, well, I don't have one available, so this could take me a while, but whenever you look at a photo, there's usually a button that says more info. And when you click on that button, it usually tells you all of this same data that was provided to you from, uh, from the camera. And um, this helps us. So it doesn't, it not only helps you, but it also helps us because when we say that you should be using some specific settings on your camera, that you should be within some certain exposure range or something like that, we actually look at this data to make sure that everything is as expected. And uh, so this is really, you know, the Wi-Fi in here is terrible, so I won't be able to show you, but we can see that here there's, this data is available to a wide range of software, and that includes websites that you upload your photos to. Uh, now this, this data can actually be manipulated, um, but um, don't manipulate it, please, because that's, this, it's, it's, not only destructive to you, but it's also destructive to, um, uh, or no, not to you necessarily, but uh, it's destructive upstream. Whenever you upload the photos and someone tries to look at it and view the metadata, uh, it's interesting to them usually to be able to show it. So if you don't want them 
to see how you took this photo for whatever reason, then you may want to remove it. But certainly for this class, uh, whenever you upload photos, uh, you should make sure that this data is intact. And, and if you don't do anything to the photo when you upload it, then there's nothing to worry about. The data will be intact. But if you open it in Photoshop, for example, even when you resave a file using Photoshop, it will append additional information saying that it was written by Photoshop. And so uh, it's, it's obvious for people to tell when a photo has been uh, manipulated or at least opened and resaved in Photoshop. Uh, so when I'm talking about all of these ways of, of manipulating photos, um, really, you, you, you can listen to me or, or you don't have to. This is just some, some advice that uh, I want to impart on you. But this is what works for me. And, and like I said before, anything that makes it faster to start processing these photos and, and get them out of your queue and up on the internet or, uh, or out to your family is, is a good thing. Whatever you can do to get these out faster and so you can take more photos in the end, that's usually the, uh, the goal, or I guess if you want to spend time with your family, but who wants to do that? Okay, so the last piece of, of advice that I, that I am going to hammer into you, and I really am going to hammer it into you, literally, I have a hammer in, in my backpack, <laughs> is that you must back up. It, it is, if I could make a requirement for this class, I would, because backing up your data is so important. I have so many stories of, of data that that I've backed up. Okay, so here's a good one. So I had a laptop with, with uh, all that Ivy Media Pro photos that I mentioned to you and an external hard drive like pictured here uh, that I would plug into the, into the machine and, and back up every day or every 12 hours or something like that. And I was thinking, okay, I'm, I'm set. I have um, a laptop with, with the, all my photos and a backup drive with all my photos. But guess what happened? One day I woke up, I went to turn on my computer, turned it on, the hard drive was dead. And I'm like, okay, it's it's a little nerve-wracking, but it's not so bad. I have a backup. But it turns out my backup was dead as well. So now, as a result, I, I did lose some photos. Not a lot. I did lose some photos, but I, it just was a fluke. And I remember going to the Apple store and, and, and because I had an Apple laptop and complaining to them that I needed a new hard drive because it had broken. Um, and, and they told me, oh, there's no way that both of them could have um, could have broken at the same time. It's statistically impossible, but uh, it actually did happen. And so you're playing with fire with hard drives. They're moving parts that are moving very, very quickly, and it's not something that you want to rely on just on having one hard drive. All of your data, all of your important bits of data, including your photos, if those are what are really important to you, you don't want to have them just on one hard drive or even just on two hard drives. I would tell you my backup scenario now, but I would embarrass myself with how many hard drives I have. <laughs> Okay, it's four. <laughs> so back up your photos. It's not that expensive to do. Even 500 gigabytes will store a ton of photos, even your really important personal data, um, maybe even some emails, so on and so forth. And this is pretty cheap. You can even go to Best Buy or any local store and find some relatively cheap hardware to an external drive to store your, your photos. And if you're truly paranoid, um, you're going to do more than just store your photos on several external drives. You will also store them in completely different geographical locations as well. Yes, I do this as well. So <laughs> the reason is that imagine, you, you know, God forbid, there's some, you know, some really apocalyptic event in your home. So it burns down, it floods, something like that. So it doesn't matter how many external drives you have, you're going to lose all of that data. Uh, and you can't store your computer in one of those big fire safes because then it will overheat, so you can't do So you really, the only way to protect yourself is to have many copies of it in as many places as possible. So um, you can, there's a variety of online backup solutions. Unfortunately, there's not a great one that I can really recommend right now for you to offload your files onto uh, either the internet or even, uh, or even someplace else. Most of it, most of the time, using an off-site backup takes work. So that means you have to uh, do something like, and what I did for a little while was I had two external hard drives. I had one plugged into my computer and then I had one in my car and I would swap them every so often. And uh, that ended up not working very well because I would never do it and the hard drive froze or something. So literally, because it was cold outside. Um, so <clears throat> these, are, these are things, risks that you take when using the computer. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's a lot of them in addition to just losing your data, but uh, it's something that you should spend time uh, trying to figure out. Yes? Are the fixed state flash drives more reliable? Um, 
theoretically they're supposed to be. Uh, they're supposed to be more reliable from bumps and shocks and that sort of thing because the tolerances on these hard drives are very low. There's, if, you're, if you're not familiar, there's a spinning platter and, and literally less than a hair's width away is, is a piece of metal that hovers over it, reading the data off of it. And if it gets bumped, then usually that piece of metal can gouge into the hard drive and there goes some of your data. Um, and so the solid state drives, which do not have movable parts, are supposed to help with that. And they do have better shock resistance but they still are prone to failures uh, because they, they will wear out eventually. Uh, they'll have you know, electrical surges. That sort of thing can also cause them to fail. Um, so they, are, they might be more reliable, but I don't have concrete data on that. But still, if you're using one, uh, you should still back up your data. And in fact, it's harder to recover data from a solid state drive than it is from a hard drive. Uh, so it's, if you do have a failure, you're worse off. Okay, so using software tools, you can actually do quite a bit more than just um, uh, organize your photos. You can also interact with a camera. And so even cameras uh, that are five years old uh, uh, have the capability, or many of them have the capability to connect to a laptop computer via a USB cable, and you can control them using software. So using Aperture or using the software that came with your specific camera, you can usually fire the shutters. You can actually click the shutter uh, from afar using your computer. And so uh, I have to say that this sounds to be of limited use, and it, and it is if you, um, for, for particularly advanced setups, but uh, if you want something that's easy. So for example, you have a studio setup where you need to take a lot of photos of something or someone, and neither your camera nor the computer is moving, this is a very good situation. It's a very good scenario because you can take a photo from your computer, it will automatically be downloaded, and you can see it on your computer right away and be able to make adjustments. And, and I guarantee that no matter how big the screen is on your camera, it's still not very big. And once you see the photo on your computer screen, it's going to look a little bit different than it did on your camera. Generally, worse, it's because it, usually when you see it, you know, the screen this big, you're like, wow, it looks so awesome. You remember chimping? Ooh, ooh, ooh. So um, <clears throat> usually when you bring it to a computer screen, which is much larger in comparison, then you can actually see what the photo looks like, and uh, you may be disappointed. And so if you, if you can have a live view of that photo just as it was taken, then you'll be able to make modifications to it uh, and um, be able to, uh, to retake the photo right away. And in fact, um, newer cameras even have the capability to, um, to display like a video feed uh, of what they see over to the computer so that you can actually, you don't even have to take a photo and it will show you exactly how the photo is framed and how it will look with that light. How it will differ is if you have flash, for example, if you have some strobes that fire and then it, it alters the light in some way. Um, but still, that can be very useful, especially for taking a look at the focus, you know, how well focused it is, if it's on a, on a macro subject or a variety of things. And um, as much as I wish that this technology was available cheaply, uh, uh, and you, it's not really possible yet to do all of this wirelessly. So, well, that's a bit of a white lie. It is possible to do, but it's just exorbitantly expensive to try to transfer uh, or to be able to control your camera wirelessly for now. So if you were thinking that you would connect your camera to your computer and be able to take shots wirelessly so that you can do some, something crazy like attach your camera to the outside of your car and drive really fast and then take photos, uh, you might have to think again because you will have to string a long USB cable from the computer over to the camera in order to do that. Um, there do exist some, uh, some, so if this interests you, there, there do exist some, some piece of hardware, I think it's called iFi or something like that, where it's, it's, they're small SD cards, and most uh, digital SLRs don't actually take SD cards, they take the larger compact flash cards. Um, but if you have a, uh, a compact digital camera, for example, it most likely takes an SD card. Uh, and that has, I believe some of the iFi SD cards actually have uh, Wi-Fi built into them, and they are, I think, somewhat reasonably priced for what they are, so that you can actually send those photos that you've taken 
over to your computer uh, remotely or, or wirelessly once you've taken them. But usually you lose the ability to have that uh, live view that I was talking about before where you could actually see the screen or you could actually see what your camera sensor sees on your computer screen uh, while, it's, while you're manipulating the settings. Okay, so one of the things that we will be talking about um, and, and not really going over much today, but just introducing you to the fact is that uh, the benefits of raw files over JPEG are quite numerous. And, and though there are some disadvantages as well, um, the, if you want the, mo the highest quality out of a photo, you will generally need to take that photo using the raw format. And when you take a photo in the raw format, because it is, as it sounds, sort of the raw data that's come out of the camera, you have a lot more options available to you in terms of manipulation uh, of that photo. And um, not only do you have these, these standard um, sort of uh, controls available to you as part of raw processing, which include exposure, saturation, brightness, and contrast, but they actually, all of these become much higher quality to adjust when you are using the raw format. Um, and really, this is meant to be just a teaser because when we're, when we're going over this stuff uh, in, in future lectures, where right now we're really taking photos in, in JPEG mode and we don't have to take any in, in raw mode, uh, hopefully a lot of this stuff will become apparent. But using um, the software tools to process photos in, in raw is actually, um, well, it's a mixed bag because though it, it does provide you with the best quality output usually, uh, it also takes some additional time for you to, to be able to process all of these photos. Um, but one of the things that we can do now when we're talking about software tools uh, is resizing and cropping. So this is actually something that, that you can do. Uh, really, it doesn't matter um, how you take the photo or, or with which uh, camera or even what software you use, but most of the time, software will allow you to resize or crop the image. And this is a good thing because uh, most of these images that you take are, are very, very large. If, you, if they're 8 megapixels or 10 megapixels or so on and so forth, we're talking about 3,500 pixels wide by about 2,500 pixels down. And that's larger than just about all of your computer screens, unless you have an abnormally large uh, computer screen uh, just sitting at home. And so when you take these photos, this, if you were to um, uh, crop them or resize them, you can actually make them a lot more manageable of a size for you to send not only to your friends and family over email, but also to, uh, uh, to Flickr, for example. And so if you keep, um, I think I'm a big fan of of keeping the original sized photographs at 100% only available to yourself and sending out slightly resized versions of those because then it's a lot easier to prove um, who's, you know, who the original photo belongs to. If you have the original 100% version of that photo, then it's a lot easier for you to make an argument and say, look, I have this photo in its original resolution. I bet you don't. And, and you, could go, you, know, you could combat any sort of uh, copyright issues that you uh, that you might be able to come across. Of course, it's not tested, but uh, it might actually work. I think. And so, but if you, it has the side benefit not only of that, but also, like I said, because we're dealing with monitors that are uh, really quite um, small in size uh, relative to the size of these images, uh, resizing them down to maybe let's say a thousand pixels wide by uh, you know however tall it is. Uh, is usually a good way to go because then that photo will still take up a good sizable portion of that user's uh, desktop, may even take up the entire thing depending on the size of their monitor, but you are making it a lot more reasonable. However, when you are cropping a photo, one of the things that you have to be concerned with is how much resolution you have. And so one of the things that we'll be talking about throughout the semester is that you really don't need to concern yourself too much with megapixels. Just about every camera available on the market today has enough megapixels for pretty much whatever you need it to do. Um, but where this does become useful is when you are cropping something, and specifically when you are cropping something a lot. So as you remember from the first lecture, we were talking about these files as being raster files. And what that means are bitmap files. And what that means is they're made up of pixels, or basically a matrix of, 
of, of small dots that, uh, that have different colors whose uh, combination in the end makes up the original photo that we see here today. And um, when, you, when you really get down to it and zoom in on one of these photos quite a bit, or if you try to crop it by quite a lot, then uh, part of the problem is that you could start to see some of these individual pixels and you would get a problem, uh, what we call pixelation. So like what you see here, and I apologize that the contrast is low, I still have to work on, on the lighting here, um, but you can see I've zoomed in quite a bit on a particular portion of this image and you can see the individual blocks on some detail in this image. And well, this, it's, it's kind of neat to look at, you don't want to do this all the time. So when you're cropping an image, you don't want to crop too much or risk resizing. And in fact, um, whenever you see some piece of software or anything uh, on TV or in the movies that say enhance and then magically you can see all of that detail that used to be there in, you know, in real life but isn't there in the photo, it's, it's a bunch of, it's, I can't, I can't say what I really think about it, but it is, it is just, it is terrible. It's not right. You cannot actually create data where there was none. As you can see from this photo, this is as much data as we have from this particular section of the photograph. And your guess is actually probably better than a computer's as to what this thing is or what the details of this thing actually look like if you were to look at it at a much higher resolution. So resizing, if you're going to resize photos, it's generally, it's, it's okay to resize photos down to make them smaller, but you have to be really careful when you're resizing photos up and making them bigger because you are risking pixelation and no matter how good of a program you were using to resize these photos, you were going to get some weirdness. So if, if you'll let me uh, use that term out of a photo when you try to make it larger, you're not going to get additional detail out of it. You're just going to begin getting pixelation or good photos or rather good pieces of software like Photoshop will try to use some tricks to try to make it look a little bit sharper, or like make it look like it's gotten a little bit more detail. This doesn't work very well and, and it will only, it's really, only a band-aid for you know a, a huge gash in the problem of, of, of resizing a photo and making it much larger. Um, so this is especially applicable to um, compact digital cameras that use digital zooms. Uh, so sometimes they have this uh, ridiculous notion. This was um, very popular, especially a few years ago, where they would say, "Oh, we have you know 120x total zoom or something like that." And when you actually got down to it you saw that it had you know, 4x optical zoom and 80x digital zoom or something like that. And all it is doing, the digital zoom, is literally just resizing the photo to be bigger. It's just making it bigger and cropping it so that the end result is that it has the same number of pixels, but you have much less data because it is as if you're taking you know, a small portion from the middle of the frame and making it bigger and getting all of that pixelation and losing all of that data that existed before and you're getting the same size file. It's just, it's just a waste for everybody. It's, it's purely a marketing thing. It, it doesn't help you uh, get any better resolution out of, these, out of these photos. It doesn't help the camera uh, resolve any additional detail that might have existed in the scene. If you have a camera that has both optical zoom and digital zoom, disable the digital zoom. It's really not doing you any favors and you can do a, a higher quality digital zoom if you really want later on on your computer. No matter what the algorithms in your camera just are not as good as the ones that are in good programs such as Photoshop that are available on, uh, on the computer. So turn off the digital zoom. It's just a waste of your time uh, and, you'll, and crop later if you really, really want to. Um, so, and, and again, uh, megapixels really aren't that important unless you're doing a lot of cropping. If you're doing a lot of cropping, so for example, uh, uh, people who take photos of birds, for example, usually need to get the longest lenses they possibly can, the biggest lenses they possibly can, and to get the most detail they possibly can to be able to crop these photos. And usually that means you will want to have a slightly higher megapixel camera. This comes at a certain expense though, and we'll talk about this throughout the semester, but usually having more megapixels is not always a good thing. Um, so be wary of that when you're when you're buying a digital camera. If you're buying, if you're looking at two, and you're 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 leaning towards one because it has slightly higher megapixels, 
don't worry about it. It really doesn't make that much of a difference. Look at all the other features uh, that come with the camera instead. That is, what is, that is what will make the biggest difference to your photos. So I, I alluded to uh, Photoshop earlier, and as, and as great of a, of a program it is, um, it really can't be used to fix everything. Uh, well, I guess really good Photoshop artists might be able to fix everything, but then at that point it's not really a photograph anymore, I would argue, and more a, a piece of digital art that, that they are manipulating. Um, but, um, and I ran across uh, a website earlier today uh, uh, from Adobe where they actually uh, were, I guess, annoyed at people for using Photoshop in a verb form where everybody says, oh, that looks so photoshopped, or, uh, or, you know, or, you know, a variety of, of how we've really brought the word Photoshop into uh, the vernacular is just a colloquial term for, uh, for manipulating these photos. And they have, and it's this, it's this hilarious web page, they have examples of what is correct and incorrect use of their, of their name. And so they say, this is incorrect, it says incorrect, colon, uh, this photo was modified by photo, oh, no, this photo was photoshopped, and then it says correct. This photo was modified by Adobe registered trademark Photoshop, <laughs> and it's, it's like, who's going to type that? I mean, I understand that they're trying to protect their trademark, and, and I'm not trying to make fun of them for that, um, but, but I, I do think that some, some part of us has to accept that there is a reason why Photoshop has become so popular for, uh, for doing these things, and it's, it is an expensive program, but it does what it does very, very well once you have learned how to use it, and, um, but it, it does come at a cost in that uh, there are excellent Photoshop artists out there uh, who do manipulate photos quite a bit. For example, this uh, Time cover uh, was a real cover that ran, uh, that Time magazine ran a few years ago, I think, and it was actually a photo of Reagan, but the tear was fake. They actually photoshopped that in, uh, or no, uh, they modified the photo with Adobe registration program. Photoshop um, and added the tier later and uh, a few people got really upset with this saying oh they're misrepresenting the photograph this is not how the, photo the photographer wanted to portray uh, Reagan uh, and um, it's it just it just caused a whole stir and in fact um, th though many people think that this is sort of a, a new thing uh, modifying photos is actually nothing new at all. We have actually been doing it for almost as long uh, as photographs have existed in the first place. Um, let's see, I have here something very cool that I think you will all like. So luckily this is, um, uh, there's, I, I'll post a link to this website later um, and unfortunately I don't have um, very good internet access so I can't uh, show you the live page right now. Um, but even photos going as far back as around 1860 have been manipulated by artists to alter them in some way, and sometimes in a very, very major and very, very real way. Okay, I'm sorry, this lighting is bothering me. Let me just try dimming them, or is that better? No, how about that? Okay. Um, so in this first photo, for example, this is uh, probably a photo that many of you might have seen of uh, former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, but uh, this photo is fake. It is not actually of Abraham Lincoln. It is actually a photo of John Calhoun with Abraham Lincoln's face pasted right on top. And uh, I don't know if this link will work, but showing you the combination of the two. Oh, here we go. We can see both. Oops. We can see both side by side. The real photo is on the right, and the doctored photo, the fake photo, is on the left. So photoshopping is nothing new. We could, uh, we could be using a different verb for it, um, um, but luckily Photoshop, or rather Adobe, uh, gets all of the attention uh, for now. Uh, but there's a variety of examples of this. So in 1930, for example, uh, Stalin airbrushed out photos uh, where he was standing next to his enemies, for example. And so this photo that's, that's visible here is actually, um, uh, they, he actually removed somebody, I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know who, he removed somebody from that photo. Or, well, he didn't, but somebody else did. And they actually did a pretty good job, I think. It's, it's kind of hard to tell 
Um, but if you look really closely, you might be able to see a little bit of a bump in the railing here that looks a little soft and a little fake. Um, pixel peepers, so they're called. People who really look at every single pixel in an image and really analyze it to try to determine if it's real or fake uh, would do a pretty good job at spotting something like this. Um, but the rest of us would, just looking at a photo, especially if it was just in a history textbook, for example, or in a newspaper, would have a hard time spotting uh, that some of these were fake. And this was, you know, years ago, years ago. They were, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, oh, this, is, this one's a good one. So this is a heroic portrait of uh, Benito Mussolini, uh, but he uh, had the horse handler removed from the, the final <laughs> photograph so that he would look more uh, heroic than, uh, than, the, than the original photo might actually convey. You can see the horse handler over here just holding onto the horse. So there's great examples of this uh, throughout history, and, and like I said, I'll link to this this page because this is a, a lot of fun to uh, to go through and read and, and of course they do reference um, something such as uh, modern techniques such as airbrushing where uh, they take photos of models and, and manipulate them to uh, smoothen their skin or enhance the color etc um, but where I think some of the the most offensive ones uh, as a photographer are ones are, that are presented by photojournalists so ones that are meant to be photos of what actually occurred and they have been modified in some way to enhance some aspect of the image and unfortunately as much as I respect them and their photographs National Geographic was even uh, uh, guilty of doing this at one point where they actually enhanced this photograph of the pyramids uh, to, in order to fit more of it onto their cover and so this may seem like uh, picking it at, at straws uh, and, and it might be but they're, they squeezed the pyramid, they squeezed the aspect ratio a little bit so that the pyramids look taller than they actually meant to be uh, in real life. And this, I think, was a misrepresentation of how that scene actually appeared in that case. Uh, and actually, we, there's uh, plenty of examples of um, this happening even in modern times. Let's see if this still exists. Uh, nope, okay. So back... Um, Let's see, this was back in uh, July of 2008. Uh, the New York Times, I think, in addition to, well, actually worldwide newspapers, uh, actually ran a photo uh, that was given to them by, um, uh, by a photojournalist in Iran, and I think the, the Iranian government had somehow gotten a hold of it. And uh, this was published in numerous major, major, major uh, web, uh, not only websites but also newspapers, the New York Times was included, where they showed uh, a variety of missiles being launched, but when they looked at it and, uh, and they analyzed this image, they actually figured out that they had added an additional missile to, uh, to the photo. So they had literally copy and copied and pasted one of the missiles, one of the nearby missiles, over onto this uh, one uh, it looks like there's a missile launcher that's just waiting there, waiting to, to uh, fire its missile, or maybe there isn't even one on there. But they decided to make it a little bit more dramatic and just add in the other one anyway. And this caused a big stir and uh, was, actually a, was actually a big thing and brought this sort of uh, this ethics problem of, of whether or not we should be allowed to modify images with Adobe Registered Trademark Photoshop or whether we should just present them as they are. Yes? Oh, really? Okay. But, um, my question is, is um, do you think that having this awareness of Photoshop now that it's become so mainstream has actually made it more of an ethical question than it used to be in terms of photo manipulation? It's a good question. Um, do I think that the ubiquity of Photoshop has really made this more of a question than it used to be? Yeah, I think it certainly is. Um, it's, it, it does seem like more people are concerned with it than we used to be. Like, uh, I certainly didn't care back when I was in, uh, in grade school uh, that that Photoshop, uh, or that rather, I'm sorry, that that photo of Abraham Lincoln might have been doctored. I wouldn't, probably wouldn't have cared even had you told me. But now that so many people are aware that, uh, that images are modified and changed 
uh, it, there really does seem to be this, this big stigma now, and, and even in the way I'm presenting it, I'm sure I am, I am uh, perhaps uh, influencing this in some way as well, that uh, modifying a photo is, is in general a bad thing. And if you're able to capture a photo that looks amazing, like one of these doctored photos, or even this, uh, this Iranian missile photo, where it had been of the real thing, that would have been great. Um, but as soon as people realize that it's been manipulated in some way, that seems to take away from the skill of the photographer, if, if that makes sense. And that the, that person is not as skilled as, as the, the people thought that they originally were, because they said they are now thinking perhaps uh, to themselves that, oh, this photo is not as how this, the scene actually was. It is manipulated and therefore the photographer is not as good as uh, he or she is presenting himself to be. So yeah, I certainly do think that this is uh, something that is becoming more um, prevalent and more noticeable. But um, I do think that uh, no matter what the end result is, uh, photojournalists and photojournalism in general should be uh, held to a, to a standard of, of presenting a photo as it was, as, because that is what they are claiming to do, so that they should not be then modifying the image, especially one as blatantly as this. And, and I mean, once there, I mean it's, it's a very gray area. So once we start talking about stuff like, well, could, could I really add maybe a little bit more red or a little bit more contrast to this photo to make it pop a little bit more? Is that okay? That's a tougher question to answer, and I think it really depends. Um, and I think even on this page, there is an example of one photograph uh, of a firefighter somewhere. Let's see. Oh, I hope it's here. Oh yeah, here it is. So um, th this photo was taken by a photo by a staff photographer for the Charlotte Observer, and he ended up being fired because he, uh, I think he uh, he um, enhanced the photo to have brighter colors or more saturated colors so that it looked more dramatic than originally was, and he ended up being fired for that. And, and was that um, acceptable? Was that a good reaction to that? It's, it's harder to say. Uh, I suppose it really depends a lot on context and, and a variety of things, and I certainly am not one to say whether or not that small of a thing was, was acceptable or not. There does seem to be sort of this, this line that, that can't be crossed, but enhancing the color I'm not so sure, and, and certainly for, uh, for our purposes in terms of being uh, photographers for ourselves, for our families, or even uh, for, um, for clients, we generally are not held by these same standards. We can enhance the color and, and perhaps are expected to, because if you really want your photos to pop, usually the way they come out of the camera is not good enough. The, the, the colors are a bit neutral, and you have to increase the, the saturation on them or even the contrast a little bit to get them to look really, really bright maybe or, or to really stand out among a crowd. And if you don't do that, uh, you're doing your photos. Uh, uh, well, I mean, this is a bit strong to say, but you're, you're doing your, your photos a disservice if, if you're not enhancing them just a little bit, I think, because providing them with that extra pop and sizzle uh, is really what gets a lot of photos noticed. And that is what, uh, how a lot of people uh, get their photos known is by having some really exaggerated feature, something that's really exaggerated in a photo, uh, nowadays at least, uh, that may not have existed before. And so, of course, you can go too far. You don't want to go too much with the contrast uh, or with the saturation, but just adding a little bit, just to, to give them a little bit something extra, is probably okay for your, for your photos. Okay. But all of this stuff, I mean, this stuff I think is really interesting, and, and, and you should take a look at this, um, at, at this website because there's a whole bunch of photos that are shown uh, throughout photojournalism history that misrepresent uh, the photos that, um, uh, that, that, that they meant, or the, the scene that they meant to, to exhibit. So in this one, for example, there's a, a photo of a, of a fire from Reuters, and they added some additional smoke to make it look more dramatic, but if you look, um, it doesn't really take much, even if you're not very familiar with Photoshop, it doesn't take much to realize that this is really, really obvious, that there's, there's, it's been obviously copied and pasted. I, I think my 
12 year old brother could do a better job than this at making the smoke look a little bit more billowy. So um, this is not, not cool because, I mean, not only did they manipulate it to make it look more dramatic, but they, they did a, you know, a, a really, they did a smackingly bad job of it too. They shouldn't have fired that Charlotte Observer guy. They should have fired this guy. Okay. But anyway, um, using Photoshop to manipulate images is, is a tricky subject, as you can tell. And there's a variety of, of uh, times when it's appropriate to do it and a variety of times when it's not appropriate. For assignments, unless you're told to do it, don't make any modifications, please. As, and, and we will know, uh, because like I said, the exit data will, reveals all. Um, but really, when outside of this class, for your own photographs or even for the final project, you'll find that manipulating these photos is a really great way um, to be able to accomplish a wide variety of tasks on them. And throughout the semester, we will talk about how to do that and how to do some really cool, really neat stuff. So let's take a quick five-minute break, and when we come back, we will talk all about light. <laughs>